praise God. Thank you, Father. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, and if you would turn to Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> we're going to take up a reading from verse 24. <clears throat> know this very, very well. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus is speaking and he says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents, and floods, and the waters rise, and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and the floods come, the winds bear against the house, and it will collapse with a mighty crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of the religious law. Amen. I'm sure you know this scripture reading very well. In fact, in Sunday school, you probably learnt it if you attended and sang songs to memorize the story. You see, we all understand these principles. They're very, they're very clear to us. That if you're going to build anything, it has to be on a solid foundation. It has to be. Does anybody ever watch Grand Designs? Yeah. Yeah, love that. Love watching that program. What amazes me is that they don't realize at the start, and nearly at every occasion this happens, <clears throat> they get halfway into the build and they're still on the thines. You know, these grand designs, they want to build out on a rock cliff, they want to build out, they want to build down into, into ground that's never been built on before. They want to build in a built up area, but they've got this wee tiny square, so they want to build right down into the ground. Lots of different places they want to build. But on nearly every occasion, you get halfway through the program and all you can see is foundations. And then they're saying, a third of the budget's gone. Half of the budget's gone. And you're thinking, well, well what are they building with the rest? But you see, they very quickly learn that the most of the money is going in the ground. Because without the right foundation, it doesn't matter how grand your design is. It's not going to stand. And that's the problem. You see, again, we are like to think we are the wise man that's building upon the rock. But a lot of us are quite foolish. We want to build something that looks good. Do you know that girl? She had the question, oh, I would have known that. Oh, have you heard her sing? Have you heard her speak? Have you heard her teach? See that guy? Have you seen what he does? Have you seen him out in his ministries? Sometimes we want to build this thing that people can see on the outside that looks absolutely wonderful. But do we have the right foundation? <clears throat> in Psalm 18 and 31, it says this, For who is God, save the Lord? Or who is a rock? Save our God. Who is God? Save the Lord. In other words, there is no one else that is God. There is nothing else that is God. There is only God. If we're not building upon him, it doesn't matter how good it looks, it's not going to stand. And in Psalm 18 and 46, it says this, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock. <clears throat> and let the God of my salvation 
be exalted. Blessed be my rock. King David learned very quickly that he needed the Lord at the foundation of his life because without that, he was going nowhere. And in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Amen. There's no doubt this morning. There's no doubt who the rock is. There's no doubt in your mind. I can see your heads all nodding. And you're listening at home this morning. And you're going, that's it, preach it, sister. That's great. That's wonderful. So knowing that he's the rock is one thing. Building upon him is something very different. Something very, very, very different. Amen. Be careful of what you're building upon. Yesterday, um, Pastor Ken and I were here in the church doing a bit of work, and the child care center is creating a little garden round at the side of the building right here. So we've been helping them as much as we can to get it done. And when you go round, <coughs> the entrance into this little secret garden is probably no more than probably about that. On a good day, I can fit three of that. Too many cakes I have to wiggle a wee bit. But it's only little people going in, so it doesn't really matter too much. So when we were looking at it and going round and in and out, <coughs> I had said to my hubby, do you know what would just make that great? See, see this bit of this wall here? If we could just take off that, now not much, just a little bit, would make the whole difference from going in and out of there. He says to me, woman dear, you can't touch that. He says, that's the foundation that's holding the building up. He says, well, yes, I know that. I'm not stupid, I know that. But look at the size of it, it's five foot wide, and it's about 15 foot high, this big bollard that comes out of the side of the building. I says, it's huge. Surely we could take a little off the corner. Who would know? <laughs> you can't touch it. You dare not interfere with the foundation of any building. Because when you start chipping off a little bit here and a little bit there, you're going to weaken it. If you've been here long enough, if you've been here over 20 years, you will have been here when we renovated this building and put on the new building at the, at the, the back. And uh, Brother Malcolm and Michael, they were working here, which is actually was rooms and they were up at the top and they were working away and the builders were on site. And the next thing they heard was this almighty And they knew right away what it was. And they ran for their lives because the whole back wall of the building fell out. The whole back wall, huge hole in the back wall fell out. Thank God there was nobody working and blew it. I think there was a cat. I think it killed a cat. But there was nobody in below it. And there was the roof. Had, I don't know what was holding that up. The sides of the building. The roof was still on. And you thought, oh my goodness. That whole building is going to come down. But no. The building was as strong as anything. Because the foundations were still intact. You see, when we build our life on the rock Christ Jesus, part of your wall might fall down, part of your life might fall in, part of your world may fall apart. But if you are on the rock, you will not be overwhelmed. Lord, I look to you. I will not be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. Lord, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. 
Give me wisdom, for you know just what to do. Amen. You see, if you left it to me, I'd be cutting the corner off that. Just so that we can get in and out easier. Makes sense to me, bringing equipment in. No. A man who knows something about buildings says to me, you can't touch that. That's the foundation. You see, as Christians today, in 2021, so many Christians chip off part of the foundation. We don't need that bit. I don't need that bit. I don't need that bit. I'm all right with this bit. That's not what the Word of God talks to us about. You see, sand used to be rock. Sand is rock that has been worn away until it becomes granules, just granules. You're not going to build on it because it's corroded. You're not going to build anything on it. Do You know, sometimes we can be building our Christian life on something that looks like rock. But it's not rock. It just looks like rock. Well, how would that be? Well, what would that mean? Well, you could be building your Christian life on a person. I know many churches that when for some reason a minister or an elder or somebody in that church left and went somewhere else, half a congregation got up and went with them. Thinking, why? Built on personalities, built on one man's ministry. Their Christian life was hanging on that person. Well, I can't stay here if they've gone. I need to go where they are. I need to, you know, I, I had once had a friend who was in four different churches, and each time it was because the minister moved. You know, every seven years he had to move. So he moved, so she moved too. And I find that hard to understand. Some people build their ministry build their, their Christian life on their ministry. Well, I, I go to that church because I've got a ministry in there. Uh, I'm a musician. I'm a singer. I'm a youth leader. I speak. I'm a deacon. I'm an elder. And they build their Christian life on the ministry. And then circumstances come along, like we have just all come through, COVID. Church is shut your ministry shut. There is no speaking on the platform. There is no singing with the praise band. There is no youth work. There is no women's meeting. There is no men's meeting. There is no door for the deacon to be on. There is nothing for the elder to do. What happened to you? What happened to you people? If you're at home today and you used to be in church and now you're still at home, what happened to you? Were you building your Christian life on the ministry? And when the ministry ceased because of COVID, did your life fall apart? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. Did we struggle when the church was shut? Yes. Did I struggle? Yes. Did I miss you? Yes. Did I miss my ministry? Yes. I do thank God, and I know he's at home, and he won't let, like me saying this, but I am going to say it. I, I thank God that our pastor, all through COVID, every single day, weekday, brought the word of God and prayer and sustained the people through COVID. And he's still doing it. Only circumstances occasionally stop him. He's still doing that. Because we need to be built on the rock. We need to be based on the word of God. We cannot let our lives be built on anything else because everything else is temporal Everything else changes. People are here today and gone tomorrow. The Word of God says that we're like the grass, the flower of the grass. We grow up today. Tomorrow it is burnt and cast, cast into the oven. It's gone. Our life is like smoke. It goes. We cannot depend on one another. We must depend upon the rock. Let's read Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we'll go to verse 21. This is Jesus 
He's talking about those that are true disciples, those that have built their life upon this rock. And he says to them, not everyone who called out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. That's very hard. And another place Jesus said to his disciples or those that were following him, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? hard. See, building on the rock is not easy. Building on rock is very, very difficult. Have you ever had to dig down into it? Have you ever had to, maybe in a garden, you wanted to plant somewhere? We've got a, an old bungalow we've been renovating, and the front garden, I have great plans for it. Great plans. Every single thing I do, every spade I put in the ground brings up humongous rocks. I go, What's with all the rocks? Ken says, well, you do know that we're actually living on sand here. This used to be the beach. All right, true. So when they're building anything, reclaiming the land, they've got a pile in the rock, pile in the rock. He says, so they've piled in the rock. And now if you want to plant anything, you're going to have to dig down into it. I said, well, yes, that's okay, love, but I can't manage a pickaxe, so there you go. So he goes, gets the pickaxe. And he's digging in the rock hard. It's hard to dig into the rock. But if you don't dig down in deep, you're not going to get a stable foundation. You know, Jesus, he tells us very clearly, if you don't know what living and working and standing on the rock looks like, Go to the early teachings of Jesus. Go into Matthew. Start at Matthew chapter 5 and start to read chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And I'm telling you now, you're closing your Bible and thinking, oh, I'm falling so far short of standing on the rock. I mean, it covers everything. He tells you your salt, your light. He tells you about not being angry. He tells you about not taking revenge. He tells you about looking after the poor and the needy. He tells you about not judging others. He tells you how to be a true disciple. He tells you how to keep God's law. He talks about your marriage and your vows. He talks about loving your enemies. He talks about your money and your possessions. He talks about your prayer life and he talks about building on a true foundation. Not easy to do but the only way to build. Let's go to 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 2. Start reading at verse 4. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Though the nations, though the mediation, through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God, as the scripture says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. 
But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as, listen to this, temporary residents and foreigners. That's what you are. You're only here temporarily. Do you know that? You're only passing through. To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. What honorable behavior? What is it that they should see when we're standing on the rock? Go back to Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7 and read it for yourself. Should I be doing all of those things? Yes, we should. But surely if somebody makes me angry, I cannot control my temper. No, but if you commit that to God, he will help you overcome. I will not be overwhelmed by my foul temper. I will not be overwhelmed by my jealous nature. I will not be overwhelmed. I will look to you. Amen. We need to be sure that we are on this rock. You see, it says in this piece of scripture something that a lot of people find hard to believe about Jesus Christ. It says, he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. Why would he make them stumble? Why would he make them fall? Because they don't like what he says. They don't like what Matthew 5, 6, 7 says. They don't like having to change their behavior. And that is why it makes us stumble and fall. It tells us that. It says they stumble because they do not obey God's word. So they meet the faith that's planned for them. Listen, if we want to be sure that we are on the rock, then we need to be living as though Christ is that rock that we are standing on. Are you willing to cause offense to follow Christ? Surely not. Sure, surely not. Surely if I'm reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's not in the, uh, there anywhere that I'm going to cause offense. Listen, you are going to offend people simply because you're Christ. If you read those chapters, he will say, listen, they're going to hate you because they hated me. They're going to despise you because they despised me. They're going to not like you because your life is going to reflect light. And they want to live in darkness. Matthew 10 and 37 says this, He who loved father or mother more than he loved me is not worthy of me. And he that loved son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In verse Matthew 12 and 46, it says this, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. And then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak to thee. But he answered and said unto them that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And then he stretched forth his hand towards the disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. You see, it's not that Jesus didn't want to go out and talk to Mary. It's not that he didn't want to go out and talk to his brothers or sisters. But he was doing the Father's will. He was talking to people about their salvation. 
He was talking to them about their lives. He was ministering at the time. And he wasn't going to be direct, taken away from it for anything or anyone. Would we feel like that? Would we say, no, listen, I know that somebody else maybe wants me to do something, but I'm putting God first. I'm standing on the rock. I'm going to do what he's asked me to do. And then I will come and I will take up my responsibilities and I will do all that I can for others. In Matthew 10 and 38, it says this, He that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And in verse 24, chapter 16, it says this, Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, being on the rock is not an easy place to be. Because when you're standing on the rock, you're up for a target. When you're standing for Christ and your life is hid in him, it is not the easy option, but it is the only option if you want to build something for Christ. I want to finish this morning by sharing a couple of scriptures that show you two things about living on the rock. And the first one is that when you are on the rock, you're in a place of safety. A place of safety. In Exodus 33 and verse 21, the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. He's talking to Moses. Moses has gone up onto the mountain and God is meeting with him there. And I, I love this. The Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me and thou shalt stand upon a rock and it shall come to pass that while my glory passes by that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. I think that's beautiful. I obviously think that's beautiful. Moses wanted to see God. He wanted to see God. See, when he came back down, the people despised him. Do you know what they said to him? Put a cloth over your face because we can't stand that shining. We can't see that glory that's on you. That's making us realize how much sin we're living in. Cover your face. You know, a lot of people will look at your life and think, will you stop talking about Christ? Will you put that Bible away? Oh, here they come. The party's over now. Will you put that cloth over your Christianity? Because you're making us feel uncomfortable. How many times do we put the cloth on and cover over? who we are or why we're there or who we love because we don't want to cause offense. I love this when he says, because I will put you in the cleft of the rock. You see, I, I love that. See, sometimes you think about being on the rock and in my mind you're out in the sea and the billows are going all around you and you're on this rock and you're safe on the rock. But everywhere around you is horrendous and fear grips your heart. But do you see when there's a little enclave in the rock, a little recess in the rock where you can get into the rock? Woo! That just changes everything. Because the wind doesn't hit you in the face anymore. The rain's not pounding down on you anymore. You're actually in the rock. He says to Moses, listen, I want to take you into the cleft of the rock. I want to bring you to the place of safety. You're on the rock. Nothing's going to happen to you. But I want to protect you. I want to cover you. I want to say to you, all is well. I am here. In Psalm 18, in verse 2, 
David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength, in whom I have trusted, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. A place of safety. The rock is not somewhere that you have to be exposed. The rock is somewhere where you can bring yourself into, into that cleft, into that place, that strong tower, that fortress, that defense. The rock is a place of safety. In 2 Samuel 22 and 3, it says this, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation my high tower, my refuge, my saviour. Thou savest me from violence. Listen, you will never be left on your own when you're on the rock. Sometimes standing on the rock sounds like a lonely place in your mind. And sometimes standing for Christ can seem a lonely place in your mind. It's a place of safety. It's a place that you won't be swept away from. It's a place that can wrap itself around you. And in Psalm 27 and verse 5, it says, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Oh, praise God. It's not a place... It's not a place of despair. It's not a place of loneliness. It's a place of safety. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of hope. It's where we need to be. And the rock is also a place of promise. In Matthew 16 and verse 18 it says, And I say also unto thee, this is Jesus speaking, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, praise God. Listen, it doesn't matter if the back wall falls out of the church. Who's holding it up? The foundations is holding it up. It doesn't matter if your life begins to fall down around you. Because if you are on the rock and the foundation is the right foundation, you will not be overwhelmed will be buffeted you will be heartbroken you will have sorrow you will have trouble why because you're human that's what happens to us in life but when we're on the rock we will not be overwhelmed i want to finish with this there is none as holy as the lord for there is none beside thee Neither is there any rock like our God. Listen, there's no other foundation to build your life upon save Christ Jesus. That is the rock. That is where you will be sustained. That is where you will blossom and grow. Don't build your life on people. Don't build your life on ministries. Don't build your life on personalities. Don't build your Christian life on any one church build your life on Christ he will plant you in a church and it doesn't matter if a wall falls down you'll still be there strong and steadfast in his love it's a place of promise Matthew 19 and 29 I want to finish with this scripture this morning it says this for everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Praise God. God will never rob you of blessing. He will never take away from you 
without giving you back a hundredfold into your life. I want to encourage you this morning. If you have been washed off the rock by life, if you have been deceived, if you have been taken away from that place of safety, I want to encourage you this morning to pray with me. God will bring you back. He's willing, waiting, ready to establish you back on the rock, Christ Jesus, so that you are never without hope, never without despair. If you're listening this morning, I want you also to join in. Let's close our eyes. Let's just pray for a moment or two. Maybe you're listening this morning, this message, and you have no idea what it means to be on the rock, Christ Jesus. You've never, ever asked him to lift you out of that mire and that clay and that sin that we all live in and put your feet upon the rock. You have an opportunity this morning to pray this prayer. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lift me up, O Lord, and set my feet upon the rock, Christ Jesus, that I may acknowledge you as my God, my Savior, and my Redeemer. If you have prayed that prayer this morning, send us a message that we might encourage you. Join yourself onto a local church. Let other Christians get behind you. But keep your feet on the rock, Christ Jesus. Lord, this morning we are so thankful that we find ourselves on the rock because you lifted us up. You set us on the rock. You've even made an enclave in that rock, Lord, that you can cover us and shelter us from what life brings our ways. Lord, this morning we thank you, Lord, that we have a sure foundation. We thank you, Lord, this morning that we're not depending on ourselves, holding up ourselves. We're not depending on any man for our salvation, our redemption. But we have put our hope and our faith and our trust in the rock, Christ Jesus. As we come to the end of our praise this morning, Lord, we pray you'll have your way. Touch those that need you. Save souls, O Lord. Reach out your hand to your people. In Jesus' name. Amen.